So thank you everyone. This is the culmination with one last event to go after this of something over four years of work and effort to bring this exhibition about. So uh, we're delighted to have Pamela Curry here at Moscow Contemporary and providing us with an amazing, powerful, dramatic, beautiful exhibition. So first I want to thank Pam for sticking with us and working together through many changes in all of our lives uh, to finally see this come to fruition. And to help celebrate this and extend its life, we have this lovely, beautiful, full-color catalog that's available in the store. And for those of you here at the talk, we're offering you a discount, so $25 instead of $28. Get your copy today. So yeah, it is lovely. I think all the work in the exhibition is included in the catalog, along with a few more pieces. And that off. So as I said, I became aware of Pam's work in around 2010 when she was working on her MFA and followed her through the years. And ultimately was able to schedule a studio visit and see her. At the time, it was in the bottom of the Grange building in Hamilton and immediately uh, was taken not only by um, the work in the studio that she had, but also her very organized and set up. In this quadrant, I did this. In this quadrant, I did that. <laughs> that. So even in her studio, the sense of the geometry that you see in the work is also in her working method and how she sets things up. So over the years, that's, she's in a new location, equally organized and set up. So it's great to sort of see the behind the scenes working method transition into the work that you see on the wall. And I think what um, has always appealed to me is that uh, sort of geometric abstract expressionism with these kind of detours off into areas that are energized and begin to become more chaotic and yet have a way of resolving themselves again. So um, I don't really want to go through the biography part of this, so I'm just going to hand it over to you to start talking about the work, because that's what people are here to hear. Okay, well, thank so, you. You're doing great. I can give my note cards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roger, and uh, I couldn't be happier to be here. Um, it's, it's a privilege and an honor to be in this particular space. Having the opportunity to show here is kind of like an artist's dream. Um, this is just such a beautiful contemporary location, and Roger and his team, I mean, if you look at the way they've curated what they hung, what they didn't hang, it's like uh, that's a second level of um, you know, it, it elevated my work. And so I just want to thank Moscow Contemporary, especially Roger, for coming to my, uh, my studio. And when it was at the Grange, it was uh, a little larger. Um, and yes, I was organized. I find that if you work in four mediums, it's really very helpful to have rolling carts with, you know, things that work on one medium and the other medium. And I had a tile floor so I could roll all my carts around. So um, I also want to thank just everybody who's here, everybody who was here last night, um, everybody who's ever followed me in, in any way, uh, because uh, in, in an event like this, an exhibition like this for me, it's like it's my opportunity to give thanks and gratitude because I really wouldn't be here with this, without the support of my family. Number one, where's my husband? Right there. <laughs> I mean, he's the sole person right now who I would say, if it wasn't for him, uh, meeting him uh, at the School of uh, Biochemistry back in 1981, I clearly wouldn't be here. And then my two sons, our two sons, I didn't do it alone. Uh, <laughs> our two sons, Kaylin and, and Evan, he's manning that camera. His wife, Abigail, is manning that camera. And Kaylin and Evan are uh, super creative, super supportive. That's why they're here with their families. And Kelly is Kaylin's wife, and she has two wonderful, they have two wonderful <laughs> children. So I just want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. And I've got note cards so I don't go off the tangent here, which I tend to do. From a very early age, I remember loving to, uh, I loved art. So from kindergarten throughout, grade school and high school, I had art in schools. And a lot of times today, 
in uh, classrooms, art has been cut. Choir is there, but not art. And I feel that the future problem solvers, creativity is, is at the, you know, that's what teaches you problem solving, whether you're a writer, poet, chef, uh, whatever you might do. So to cut that out of programs makes me really sad. So part of my mission, I think, as an artist is to definitely promote art to any age, anyone, any level. That's why, even though the show was postponed several times, and I had five workshops post, well, canceled. I had three scheduled for New Zealand, one for Vienna, and one for Bainbridge Island. So when that all happened because of the pandemic, I kind of pivoted and I created my own online art school. And the whole purpose of that was to share my experience, what I know, but I'd say almost to a greater extent to learn. I think to, to teach is to learn. And I have to say that as much as my the, I don't want to call them students because they're my peers. So Robert Simmons and many other people who are here who are in my pro membership or in my art and success school, uh, we are peers and we exchange ideas and I learn as much from them, even more perhaps than they do from me. That's the joy of teaching. And that's why I don't plan on retiring unless you know my computer did uh, uh, <laughs> have a nervous breakdown the other night and doesn't work anymore. That was probably a good thing. That was an unforeseen event. And that, the title, of course, Unforeseen, is uh, kind of a metaphor for life. Uh, I toyed with a lot of titles, but, you know, first the titles that went through my head were about energy and chaos and all that kind of thing. But in the end, it was like, you know, given what's happened over the last four years, I would say that Unforeseen, uh, everything from the pandemic to what's been happening politically, having two new grandchildren, um, having our oldest son married and you know the ups and downs like the highest highs to the very lowest lows so I feel that the work here for me it's it's fun to see the work all together like this in that it's not good or bad to me what it is it's me and that's what I need to feel is this me or is this somebody else because for the longest part of my life maybe the first 25 years so that would not be the longest part of my life <laughs> not saying how old I am, but uh, I would say that my art wasn't me. It was pretty. This art, I don't intend for it to be pretty. I intend for it to be me. There's a big difference because I'm, I'm no longer as impacted by what the public thinks. I finally broke away from that pressure of trying to please other people, which took me a very long time to do. And now I, uh, uh, I, I'm not trying to paint pretty florals and pretty landscapes, you know. Now you learn a lot by doing that and there's nothing wrong with that, but for me personally, it did not express who I am. My life was full of tremendous highs and lows. And pretty flowers just don't express the lows. They express the highs, but life is not just pretty, it's also got the other side. So I feel that in my work, there's this contrast between kind of maybe pretty, but then there's like an underlying current. And when I finally decided on the title of Unforeseen, it allowed me to see the work in a diff through a different lens, actually. The title became very important because once I had the title, everything made sense. So the title really matters, and the title of the work matters. All, a lot of these names of my pieces changed when I came up with the title. And also, just so you know, before <laughs> I started this, I took some Vogue tab, and um, there's some free samples over there. If you think that I have energy and that I kind of have done a few things that um, as old as I am, I can still like function, uh, it's largely due to uh, my, our son's product here, which is just, it's a lot of energy and focus. And so there's some free samples over there. It's called Vogue Tab, and, and I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but I'm very proud of them. And so I want to show you my package. <laughs> it's got a Ziploc and you can actually like zip it up and put it in your pocket and take it with you. That's why I have it here in case I fall over. Um, okay, so yeah, my, my dad and my mom and, and my sister, uh, who is actually there from the day I was born, Donna, I wanna thank her for coming all the way from Michigan. She uh, came, I think, from the farthest away. And um, she's been here to support me. Um, we are tied at the hip, and when we get laughing, you can't stop. And so, don't make me laugh. <laughs> there are, and as we go around and, and I talk about the works, and I want you guys to ask as many questions as you possibly can. The fellow artists, members, peers, who understand the visual language of art, because that's what we're working on. There is an underlying geometric basis to all. I'd say every piece here, and I think that's the left side of my brain where I was 
I forced myself to go through calculus and geometry and trig and algebra and all those things that, yeah, I could do it, but you know, and I do think there's part of me that likes that, but not the actual math, but more just the organization. So maybe that's why my studio is somewhat organized. And, and, and that's just part of me, and I, I wouldn't have known that until I started to just paint and paint and paint. Now, there was no geometry in my florals, surprisingly, right? When I was a young mom, I never thought about geometry. So the only way you find your personal voice is to do, to do it. And, and also the thing about art that I, I think is so true is that anybody who's creative and writes, does poetry, whatever you do, your creativity, and if you create art, the beauty is that you leave something behind. You say to the world, I was here. And I do think that's um, you know, pretty important. So uh, it's the one thing we can do and say, hey, we were alive, we lived on this earth. But in any piece, you're gonna find a combination of things in differing proportions. There's this continual balance or imbalance between opposing forces. So in this particular piece, because I'm standing here, there's a lot of chaos, but there's also some order. For example, the grid. Now, sometimes the grid appears in an obvious way. Sometimes it appears as an underlayer and sometimes it appears as a very forceful top layer. Where the grid comes in is, I like to say that each piece is like, I'm in a conversation with each piece, and also each piece is like my child. I feel that having had two children, that I didn't even really realize how much the paintings were like children. They do have timeouts. <laughs> I get really frustrated at times, but I never throw them away. <laughs> and I do like to talk to my, uh, the members in my group because they're like, I'm so frustrated, I just want to throw it away in the garbage. And I, my thought now is, would you throw your child away? And then they think twice. One of my famous things that I like to say is that ugly is good. That's perhaps why people like to follow me because I am like the representation of ugly is good. And I talked to Donna this morning like, didn't mom say something growing up about the lotus flower? You know how it kind of grows up out of the mud and, and it's really ugly and then you know it becomes this beautiful flower and she's like, you know, I don't remember her talking about that anymore at all. And I'm like, well, I heard it all throughout my life. Now why did I hear it? And she didn't hear it. I think that um, ugly, is, ugly is one thing to actually celebrate because especially in art, if you have ugly, it's telling you what you don't want. If you don't want that, go the opposite end and figure it out what you love. So art is about what you love. It's, it's about what's inside of you and nobody had to tell you what food you love, what shoes you love, what car you love, what color you love. Your painting has plenty to tell you, but what I feel is that it's a whisper. And oftentimes we artists are in such a hurry to finish a painting. We want to get it done. We have a show coming. We have so many things on our plate. I just want to get it done. Why is this not working? I'm frustrated. I'm not an artist. I'm going to put this painting away. I'm not going to be an artist anymore. But our paintings are telling us something. They're saying, you know what? It, you're, it's ugly. So hey, stick with me. Bring me up. Uh, you know, I'm a child. I want to become a teenager. I want to become an adult. I want you to sign me. But it's going to tell you when it's ready. You don't have to ask anybody else. Your painting will tell you. My, my mom said growing up, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And my dad said, education is a shortcut to experience. Um, that's very true. While I did get my first degree in biochemistry, it kind of turned out to be a disaster. But on the other hand, I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for the disaster. I wasn't at the time. I was very confused. But now looking back, it's like, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be here. So everything. It doesn't always make sense, but as an artist, the, the advantage is that you can pour it into your art. No matter how much tragedy you have, no, ma no matter how much joy you have, we as artists are so lucky. We can pour it into our art, and uh, I feel very fortunate to be an artist. So this one is oil and cold wax, lots of geometry, limited palette, lots of harmony. The key to harmony in harmony versus disharmony, right? Because there's all these contrasts, thick and thin, large and small warm and cool, chaotic and organized. So this one began is total chaos. This, this is an indication. These little windows here are what's left of a live Zoom and paint call I did with my, some artists. And we all had fun on Zoom. And it was just crazy and chaotic. And uh, I started with a blind contour drawing of the members in our group. And then I let it dry and you know stuck it away for a while and got back to it. It's like, wow, this is like hard to look at. So then I started, the next thing I did was this red line here 
to begin that transition from total chaos to a little bit less chaos. Well, that helped because now I could, the, the eye follows the line. But then I, I added this other color, um, this yellow, in a grid format. So you may not see it at first, but notice how these yellow things are pretty much in a grid. But I'm very much a layering artist and because it gives you depth. And also, the red line forms a navigation through the painting. And then the final thing I did was these, I overlaid the um, geometry, the grid, and I varied the transparency. So you can see how transparent this is. Uh, whenever you see through a color, uh, like this here, a little bit of transparency, versus opacity, that's something the artist, it's a tool that we have. And, uh, hi there, Willa. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, I have a question. Uh, so pretty clearly they were first painted as a diptych with the right hand one turned 90 degrees. Why yes. did you not want it hung that way? Well, because you reminded me that in the catalog it was rotated the other way. <laughs> but aside, no, I know. Before that. Okay. All right. Why well, is it that way to have it? Okay, oh, right, because uh, the name of this one is called Disconnect. So again, the titles, if you look closely, a lot of them have to do with uh, the last four years. I felt that Disconnect, again, I, I toyed with a lot of titles, but Disconnect seemed appropriate because if you rotate this panel, I think it's counterclockwise one turn, these red lines actually match up. By rotating it, the other way, okay. Okay, there you go. But by rotating it, they do not connect anymore. And for me, that, that's a metaphor for how disconnected I felt, you know, going from having these workshops to go to, flying on a plane, seeing tons of people live to, oh, I'm isolated in my studio now, and it's a very different situation. But disconnect refers to so many things that happen in life. And again, every piece, I feel, this is not objective work, by the way. This is not, in, in case you weren't sure, um, this is not Norman Rockwell painting. That was my dad's favorite artist. And, and if he had seen this now, he'd be like, I know what he'd say. He'd be like, you know, nice job. And, and then it would be like, yeah, duh, right? <laughs> and it's okay. Like, I'm fine with that now. But at the time when I, like, you know, 30 years ago, that would have been really hard to hear. So anyways, yeah, so this is not Norman Rockwell. But what this is, um, I'd like to say that there is a conversation that I can tell you exactly, I can decipher using, using the visual language of art what this piece means. So for those people from the general public who walk in here and say, oh my gosh, my three-year-old could do it, my first, and I have seen that comment multiple times, especially on my YouTube channel, and at first I got kind of like, wow, that wasn't very nice, but then it was like, uh, wow, thank you, because that's really a compliment. I think in life I, I try so hard to get back to that time in my life when I could paint without any concern. And so now each, each painting does start as a child. I do let it, um, I like to start with play. I call it play, right? I, I literally put myself into the mindset of Willa, who's two and a half, but you know, two and a half, three, it's all good. You don't think about this becoming a successful painting at all. It's just like show up and do something, you know, and love the process. It's the process that keeps you going, not the result. It's the journey, not the destination. So again, lots of um, balance between, or I should say, uh, there's a contrast between chaos and order. And then in this piece over here, um, this one was a challenge to myself and what I did was I, I uh, took some colors that I wouldn't normally want to paint with. like. Not that I don't like them, but I'd never tried them together. I did some color swatches, so I'm a big promoter of, hey, just try out a few colors together. This is probably only um, three colors plus black and white. So again, limited palette. That's when you limit your palette and you automatically get harmony. That's one less thing you have to worry about. Um, but like most of the pieces in this exhibition, I turned on the video camera. And uh, that whole thing uh, started when I first got my cell phone and I hit the video button because I didn't know anything about my cell phone. It had all these features and I'm like, well, what's this? And I just happened to point it at a painting I was doing and then I time lapsed and I threw it on YouTube and then um, I, I noticed that people were interested and I thought, well, that's really weird. Um, and then I started to just do that more and more because I wanted to document for myself and I was hoping that future generations might be able to 
you know, maybe get something from what I've learned. So I turned on the camera as I was doing this, and much to my shock and horror, it became about the ugliest thing I've ever seen. And I was like, wow, should I turn the camera off? I was really tempted, and I was feeling like this sick feeling in my stomach because normally things don't go that badly when I turn the camera on. Um, but this was really bad. And I posted the very first, like, video and people were like so supportive like oh I don't think it's ugly is you know and I'm like yeah sure um, but then I just kept with it and I was like I'm not gonna let it go and I that video is upstairs I think in part and uh, so paintings that start with play tend to be ugly you know like children don't say gosh my painting's ugly right they're like they're happy and then they go take a nap and then they want a snack and then they come back again and they create something else who cares right that was my attitude or it is my attitude so I really try to do as an adult is say you know what it's ugly so what because ugly is so good if it's ugly if like I call these uh, desaturated colors and that's really what it was all desaturation well how am I going to make this into a painting that I can actually say that I love and I'm willing to sign it well what it needed was if it's if it's desaturated and I hate it well what about some saturation if it has no contrast, which is the difference between lights and darks, well, why don't I add some contrast? Uh, so whatever it doesn't have, and it's ugly, then all you have to do is put what you, the opposite, and perhaps it'll be a, a step in the right direction. So that's kind of what this one's about. Does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. So a couple questions I have is, uh, when do you um, start paying attention to value? Do you pay attention to value when you're, still in that play stage or when you bring it up to that more explore stage, then do you start looking at value and adding what value you need? Yeah. And the second question is, um, you, I know you love shape and you like your gems. So what are you differentiating between these large shapes and your gems? Like, I'd like you to point out your big shapes. Okay, I mean, they're pretty obvious, right? This is a big shape. This one came on uh, toward the end because I asked myself, well, what don't I have? Well, I don't have a big shape. I had, uh, like, lots of minute little things, you know, this size. Size is one of our design elements. So there's a big, gigantic mark, and we have very fine lines. This is a big mark. It's true. Now, uh, so... Janet is asking about some very specific things that have to do with our uh, design elements, and... Um, Okay, so as far as value goes, value is how light or dark something is, right? And, you know, as artists, we kind of think about three groups, dark, light, and somewhere in between, mid-tone. So anything like this area here is all mid-tone. And if I'm in the play stage, see, because I've been painting for a long time, right, if a child is not going to think about values. And when I say play, put your mindset in that of a two- or three-year-old, obviously, I can't help that I'm an adult, right? I'm an adult trying to act as a child. So therefore, I might be aware of what's light and dark just because I feel a, a um, push and pull. So I often don't think about value in the play stage. It's all about just throw it on there and don't even worry about it. Just get it on there. Just like anything is better than a blank canvas or a blank panel. Then I move into the next stage, which I, I correlate that, or the metaphor for that is like being a teenager. Okay, it's a pile of, it's just awful. Teenagers are often very critical of their lives and the way they look and, you know, I've got acne and nobody likes me and all these things. And they, they want to fall in love for the first time and they, they find somebody and they're excited. All those things. So, but it's a time for risk taking. So at that point, I might be like, let's say this is all mid-tone and it's like, all of a sudden I put a dark in here. I might put a dark here. I might put a dark here. All of a sudden, everything changes because now, um, as we're learning, uh, the eye sees value before color. So that's hard. That's a hard concept. Value is, is, is more noticeable than color, but it actually is. When you convert this to black and white, all this stuff here is mid-tone, but then you see the occasional darks. Those darks are, I'd say, pointing to my gems. So let's just say that a gem is an area that, wow, I, I really like that shape, right? So notice how you might find the highest contrast near something that I felt was kind of something I really like. So this is a pretty high contrast area. The red and the green are very high. They're, they're as far apart as you can get. They're across the color wheel. Um, this very uh, high contrast be, be, uh, between it and its background in terms of value, the loopy lines, dark against mid-tone, 
Um, this high saturation against desaturation, this high saturation against desaturation, this being dark against light. So it's, jams are kind of a loose term for, because there are many types of composition, I'm using these high contrast areas to move the eye around the painting. So if I only had one thing and you're like, wow, I see this, but I don't see anything else then to me that's not using all the real estate of a painting. So in answer to your question, it's, it's something that I listen to the painting and it, it tells me like, nothing's going on here. Maybe you better do something that I can see. I'm not gonna see it unless you do something with value or high saturation or something. Whether it's a gem or not, I, that's clarify. I kind of figure that out and refine it in the end. Does that answer your question? Do you ever put down color if you know you're gonna scrape back into it? and you want to balance, say, orange, you've got it on this side, you want it on there, there. do you ever purposely put down a red orange, cover it up with some desaturated color so that you can then go back in because you know it's underneath the previous layer so that you know you can scrape back into it and get that orange? Yeah, see, that's such a good question. And absolutely, art is like a chess game. You're always, the, like, the longer you paint, the more it becomes kind of like a chess game. It's like, if I want this thing to end up high key, for example, which means very light, I might start with black. If I want it to end up cool, I might start with warm. And on the other side, uh, there's a painting that was, um, literally, I took almost every color I had that was primary, secondary, um, in squirt bottles. I had the two panels on the floor, and I, I basically did the Pollock thing, you know? <laughs> one color over the other, it was so god-awful. Right. And that probably has the, one of the most views, because people are like, well, how come she can do that? Um, I can do that, right? I, I can throw paint on there. And I guess it gives them hope. Um, and then I walked them through how uh, the painting on the other side, you'd never guess it was that one, because the only amount that, of that crazy color left could fit on a postage stamp. Mm -hmm. But, so again, I started with the opposite of what I, I didn't know I wanted a quiet painting, but the painting told me, wow, just know this is not you. You better cover me up, like fast. And don't leave much of that behind because that's not you. Um, yeah, great question, Janet, thank you. Anybody so, else? So all of these are diptychs here. And, mm -hmm. um, so when do you make that decision that it's going to be a diptych or a triptych or yeah. neither? That's a good question. A lot of these started out as one single sheet of paper. This is paper mounted on panel. Um, that one is, is straight on the panel. Um, the diptych is, allows me to kind of have an option, like just like in your closet, you know, you want to have an option, like for tonight or yeah, this morning. I was like, well, I've got five options. How am I going to feel this morning? What do I want to wear? Either I'm going to wear sweatpants because I'm like, not feeling too good. All right, so when you start with two panels together, you've got more real estate. And worst case scenario, um, you, you slap on the play period and, and, and it looks really awful. Um, but if you bring, they're kind of like sisters. You bring them up together, you know, and they speak to one another. Either they stay together as a pair be, because I kept that, that insight of like, oh, okay, I'm liking what's happening. On the other side, on the other, in the other uh, gallery side, um, I've got two paintings that uh, looked a lot alike, but diverged. I also have one of um, two pairs that were done. Um, the other one's not here, but it, it also diverged. So it was, became its own entity. So it's, it's a decision that happens along the way. I'm always thinking, yeah, these could stay together, but I'll never commit to that. I will not know until the end. Yeah, so good question. Well, they, um, all these are symmetrical. <coughs> Each one is the same size. Yeah, right. But that's not true for this one here. Right. Oh, that's a story. <laughs> okay, that's that's really um, observant. And uh, thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, that was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> a big mistake. And I I, uh, I definitely told everybody on my YouTube channel what I did and how disappointed I was. And don't ever do this. You know, part of what I do on YouTube is like, don't do this. I just did it. Don't do it. <laughs> and. One thing that does, uh, there's a, a really nice compliment from an artist that Roger had, I think it was your first artist, uh, Roger, in, in this, now that he's become his own Moscow contemporary. He used to be with the Pritchard Gallery with the University of Idaho, but anyways, he said to me um, that, well, what he noticed was that 
uh, I, I tend to like the square format a lot. So you'll notice that part like cohesion is another big thing that artists tend to obsess over. Like, oh my, who am I? Um, I'm 16 personalities. And, and, and Byron will tell you that I, I always said to him, what, what the heck? Am I like schizophrenic? What's wrong with me? I had those very same feelings. It's one thing to say that when you're kind of like a young artist and you clearly, uh, you know, but I, I have to say even now, um, Cohesion is important to me, but it's not, it's on a slider. Uh, the contrast to cohesion is diversity. And what I've realized about myself is that I'm not that artist who can have a gallery like this size and have everything with only one tiny thing changing. Like I could do it on a small scale. I could do like five by sevens and I've done that in a series. But in a show like this, if I were to do that, I would, I would not be energized by it. I can't do it. I don't want to do it. At least not now, maybe when I'm 80, and my eyesight's not good anymore, everything will just vary by one little thing and I'll be more cohesive and everyone will say, oh, finally, you figured out who you are. <laughs> but no, this is who I am right now. And I really don't care what anybody says to me. Um, oh gosh, you know, why aren't you, why aren't all your paintings like this? I don't even know who you are. That's fine because um, all I can say right now is this art is honest, it's me. And I know that because I come in here and it's like, oh, it's like I've come home. I don't want to walk into this gallery and say, oh my God, like, who is this? So, um, yeah, so basically, they're, you're right. Um, these are all very much, so you know now that one of the things I love, what I hope you guys get from this is that I hope you can see the things that I love. They speak of who I am. Um, the square format is who I am. I was told very young, don't ever use a square format. It's very hard to make it work. I don't know if that was like a challenge that I heard, but somehow I was like, yeah, I'm going to try it. And then I was like, wow, I really like it, so I'm going to stay with it. I have a very hard time thinking in terms of a rectangle anymore. Um, that piece on the other side of the wall started as a uh, rectangle that was supposed to become a diptych. But because I mismeasured, it became a quad drip tick or whatever it's called. Um, it's still rectangular, but it's meant to be two squares. So that, and, and this one over here, my favorite things, um, that one is uh, not quite, like these are not quite square, I don't think. I think that they're, right, they're not. They're a little bit taller, but again, so I, I, I diverge from that in some ways, but, um, and I think partly my heritage that my, our mother was Japanese, and so uh, part of what I'm always like really thinking about is um, dots and stripes. You know, dots and stripes are so much a part of me, and I got this one book on Japanese kimono patterns. And uh, the very few pa first pages were like some fabric, and all it was were these simple dots and stripes. I thought, it's just so beautiful. Maybe someday I will be able to clearly do less is more. I'm not. I, I do try to think about less is more, but obviously I'm not as successful at times. <laughs> because I, I remember arguing with my, my grad school professor, like, no, more is more. <laughs> and only now am I starting to understand that, well, maybe if you got rid of some of that junk in there, you know, your gems would show up more. It's okay, though. It's, uh, sometimes I let chaos um, be the thing it's about. Other times, like this one behind Evan, is a little bit more quiet. Now that, it just depends. I'm not, I'm not predetermining anything. I do not have any idea. Um, and some will say, gosh, you know, again, my three-year-old could do it. But the thing about non-objective work, think about it, you have nothing to look at. You have no landscape, no portrait, no flower, nothing. I mean, I'm not saying that the, that the clover is there, but the clover is there to say what this painting is not about. So oftentimes I'll say, uh, when people say that, wow, I, you know, I really like that painting, but why do you have a clover there? Or is that a number three? And it's like, yeah, but see, I, I stick that in there to show you what it's not. This is not about anything identifiable in life. This is about inner emotion and the drips and, you know, that old wall feeling which came from a sander. There's so many layers on here because life is like that. Life is like layer upon layer upon layer. And what you end up seeing on the outside, um, just like us, any one of us has a life that if you're an artist, you can actually try and evoke a sense of good and bad and happy and sad and new and old. You know, all those things can be in a painting, which is so fascinating. That's why it's, it's just such an honor to have this opportunity to share work with you. And so um, to move along, maybe we should move. And those are encaustic on this back wall, which means that they're painted with hot wax. Um, I paint in four mediums, but this ex exhibition is really three mediums. There's no encaustic on paper. These are encaustic on panel. And um, 
I just want to say that you, you can touch the surface of these. Um, they are made with beeswax and Demar resin are the, the main component and then obviously there's color that you add to the wax. And instead of waiting for oil paint to dry, you're waiting for wax to cool. And if anyone's dropped candle wax on their hand and it's like, ouch, you know, but it doesn't last for long, it goes away. So you've got a very short amount of time to get the wax from the pot to the surface, but encaustic means burning in, right? So you hit, I use a propane torch. I don't often use a heat gun. And uh, when, I, when you burn in, you, you burn in every single layer. So if there were 10 layers, you're burning, you're hitting it with a pro propane torch, another layer, propane torch, another layer, or even a little section. And these are mixed media. There's also other like mediums in here. But again, the grid is, is underlying here. Um, this one's kind of an all over composition. And then one on the end there is uh, just more quiet, you know. So there's like a, again, a slider bar between quiet and active or um, order and disorder. Like those are the constants in my work. So we can move now. Any questions at all about anything here? I had just a general question. Are we going to be going upstairs as well? I don't know, Roger. It's up to you. Sure. If there's, yeah, if, oh, enough, sure. Who, sure. Whoever would like to. I was just thinking about up oh. above here, the little squares. Sure. I'd like to talk about that. Thank you. Anybody who wants to, to go upstairs and wants to stick around that long. So uh, like I mentioned before, a lot of these paintings uh, are documented on my YouTube channel. Not because, um, I mean, it started out, you know, just as me trying to figure out what I'm doing. And I often find that when I replay a video, it's like, wow, I don't believe I said that. I didn't know I was doing that. I'm, I'm, su I'm surprised I did that. And for that reason, um, I feel thankful that I have this to remind me what I did. And it also lets me know that my, it's kind of a strange thing to be talking and painting at the same time because it means your left brain is actually working. But I don't know, for whatever reason, it, I can talk and paint at the same time. That's just a strange thing. But anyways, the, the history behind this painting, if you kind of just like forget that there are these divisions, you can imagine it being finished and cut into two. But uh, when I, this is like one of the first times I ever worked on paper and I, I was like, well, you know, I never expect a painting's gonna work. So I didn't really measure it very well. I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't measure it very well and I stuck it up on the wall and then when it was all done, it was like, wow, I kinda like that. But when it came time to mount it on panel, it's like, wait a minute, this, this is so like off by measurements. And what it meant though was that mounting it on these four panels became this like huge, traumatic, challenging, um, I mean, it, it just was uh, like one of the first times I mounted any like paper onto panel, so there was that, and uh, you know the lines had to match up. And I, I found that if I put the glue on the back side of the painting, it expanded and it didn't match anymore. So there are all kinds of like things. But again, failure is not another big thing for me. Like I love to fail, because if I hadn't failed with this one, um, it, it taught me something. So. Again, one of the things that I, I really love to talk about is how important failure is. Um, I, I would rather have, you know, a um, hundred failures than, than one success because I really don't learn anything from success and I don't even really know what that word means anyway. It's like for me, it's like it's not about success, it's about what did you learn? And so throughout this ex exhibit, it's about like what haven't I done? What can I explore? What can I learn? And I often will like give myself a challenge to throw myself purposefully into a ditch so that I have to get myself out. The more times that I do that, and this is a very great example, I, I didn't intend to throw myself in a ditch, but I was in a ditch. And I, I could have just said, you know what, I mismeasured and I just can't do it. And okay, forget it, I'll cut it into 25 small pieces. You know, I'll just crop the heck out of it and have a lot of small pieces. But I'm also not a cropper. I feel like cropping is, I used to do it all the time when I was in watercolor, like, wow, there's so, all these great compositions, but that's an easy out. It's much harder to stick with a painting that's looking awful and pull the composition together than get out your little angles and start cropping these tiny little things and they get smaller and smaller and smaller and you, you feel really good because you've got all these paintings, but it's much harder to, to bring the larger you work. Um, the more, you know, more challenging it can be. So anyways, limited palette. You can see that um, I love the indigo blue or Payne's, Payne's, Payne's gray, um, but limited palette. Um, all the artists who are here know that if you limit your palette, one color, the one upstairs in the video room, that's one color plus black and white monochromatic and kind of a tough, um, 
color schemes, I was really happy when Roger hung that in the dark. <laughs> but um, two colors is like, you know, that's, that's so many colors. Three colors is like, you need a palette about six feet long. And then, uh, you know, some of these other ones, uh, there's color, there's not just a limited palette, but there's small quantities of saturation. So that's, the, any questions about this one? This one is um, actually three. It's like um, transparent um, oxide, transparent brown oxide or orange oxide, and then Payne's gray. So why do you call it a failure? Oh, well, I mean, I don't call this a failure now. <laughs> In fact, this is one of my favorite paintings, but it was a failure, uh, in, you know, like anything, you can look at anything in life and it's like, okay, well, I could have done better with this, but let's, and a lot of people are like always so critical about themselves. I, and I, I try to encourage people to say, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, like in the Facebook group, they're like, oh my gosh, I did this and this and this and this and this wrong, I hate it and all this stuff. And it's like, but, but look at all the things you did right. And in this case, I did a lot of things that I love. The only thing I did that I failed with was the measurement. I can live with that. Um, and so I was determined to make it work um, because I loved the painting. I just didn't like the measuring. And I was really mad at myself for mismeasuring and being so sloppy. But again, I learned from it. And this piece is definitely about chaos. But it's called continuity because in spite of the chaos, um, the panels do, like the lines do line up, um, unlike the disconnect piece. I didn't rotate panels. You could, and these could actually um, stand on their own each, but um, I, I hung it this way because for me, it shows that in spite of chaos, there can be a lot of, like, there is this continuous thread through life. So, yeah, that's the story. I think the fact that they're all different, it depends on different size, adds to the visual appeal. Some people have said that. Imagine if they were all like, if it were a diptych, for example. I kind of agree, and, and again, it's a happy accident, and I'm, I'm open to happy accidents because that's usually how I work. <laughs> so um, just, a little, you know, we can kind of just step over here then. And uh, this one uh, is a, a piece that came together kind of, you know, late toward the end of like the preparation for Roger coming to my studio with the U-Haul and picking him up. And I was so grateful that he was willing to do that because normally artists have to deliver their own work. And he said, oh, no, I'm going to come by your house and pick him up. And I was like, oh, great. And I was really, really excited. And uh, this one, so I do have problem children, definitely. Um, some that were in timeout for a long time, <laughs> way longer than Evan or Kaylin were in timeouts. Uh, the advantage is I didn't have to feed them. I didn't have to take naps and, you know, just turn them around and, and forget about it. So this one was like uh, in the Grange studio. Uh, I actually, the very first uh, pass was like, I loved it. I hung it. I even tried to sell it. But then it didn't sit with me well, so I turned it around. And then I brought it out and uh, just looked at it with kind of disgust. Um, I put one little shape on here thinking that I could start to revive it, couldn't do it, turned it around again. But when I brought it to the new studio, something happened when I brought, came to the new studio. I don't know what it was. I think the Grange got, was so big, and, and it's after our house burned down in 2016, I went to the Grange, that's why I went there, and uh, the Grange started with like just walls and a floor. There were no, 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 nothing. I had no supplies left, you know, I had to, but by the time I left, I could barely move. And it was like by the time I moved back to our house, we had to renovate the garage, and it's like, Finally, I'm starting from scratch again, and I can breathe. And I think that's what happened. It's like I start, I put, this, pull this one out, immediately started working on it. It's like, like that. It just came together. And this one, though, is not, you know, it doesn't really have gems. It doesn't. It's an all-over pattern, as I talk about, right? If you were to take this photo and convert to black and white, there's not a whole lot of variation in black and white. Um, color, like these colors here, are midtone. This is midtone. Yeah, there's some lights, but it's like a scratch board. It's kind of this for me became like I'd walk past it and I'd add another mark, and I walk past it and make another mark. One day it was this. You know, one day I was testing out a Posca pen. It dripped. Um, sometimes there's cryptic things in there. There's this um, uh, a grid that you can see if you come up close. I took with an awl. You know, part of using an awl on a board is very satisfying because you're like. 
It's partly physical. You need to put some real effort into it, right? Anyone who's worked on a wooden panel, to get that to show, you've got to put some real force in there. It could be a nail or an awl or whatever, but there's a grid here. And then uh, what happened was I took, I, I said to myself, okay, there's a lot of chaos here. And I wanted one blue that I loved. And I it came up with this dusty blue. And I put it on a brayer and I started to go like this. And all of a sudden this secondary grid appeared, which I, like this, this, that was my brayer. And I was like, what the heck, where did that come from? So I went with it. And then, you know, the, between the, the uh, these lines and the grid that came from the paint, I just added a few touches. I, I worked on it for like, you know, whatever, a month, adding a little bit here, a little bit there. I call it whiteboard because a whiteboard is meant to be kind of this uh, ever-changing note to yourself, things to do. You know, certainly Kaylin and Evan have a whiteboard that's six feet long. Uh, but this became my whiteboard. Um, here are some things that are partially identifiable, like, you know, I did some blind contour drawings of pears. Um, you can look in there and there's like the W for Willa and there's an A's and E for Evan. So I work in the letters of our family a lot of times. You guys don't even notice it, but that's kind of the point. I don't want to be too literal, but of course my family is always on my mind, you know? <laughs> and so you'll find in a lot of these works, like I've, I've managed to fit uh, initials in. So that's that one. Any questions about this? It's not as high contrast, right? The one behind Roger, that's super high contrast. The push and pull. This one feels rather flat. Do you guys feel that? There's not a lot of depth, but because it's not about depth. Um, and then this one, uh, like this is considered high key. So the visual language of art is we've got lights, midtones, and darks. The blue one is, is essentially like all midtone. This one is, is if you squint, is, is much lighter. So this is called high key, high light values. But you know, there's the occasional dark. There's, I love stripes. Um, I love red. So what this tells you is that I'm kind of featuring funky shapes, the ampersand, this is called ampersand. I'm featuring stripes. Um, I'm featuring, and this one, this really is less is more, which is a rare thing for me. <laughs> So if you're wondering why, like, where's the crazy stuff? There is a lot of crazy stuff underneath, but I quieted a lot of this down. And the occasional ge geometry, because what doesn't this have? It doesn't have, it doesn't, it's not about geometry, it's about curvilinear. But you need to have a little bit of what this painting is not to feel um, this texture is kind of being featured because it's not this. It's not, it's not about geometry. This is not a grid. This is not rectilinear. So you've got a choice between rectilinear and curvilinear and this is not about the grid. This is one that's not about the grid. This one obviously is. And these two have a story in that, um, again, these two were pulled together very quickly. Um, they suffered in the grain studio, were turned around for a very long time. I brought them to the new studio, hung them together and it's like, you know what, I just got to finish these because I have a show coming up. And I uh, there's a piece upstairs in the corner that uh, I kind of want to do a series uh, on it, and it, it was the precursor to this one, which is a grid, um, but there's so many variations of the grid. But what, what this one features for me is um, the grid and stripes, because, but these stripes are very subtle. Like, you know, you can kind of see there is a stripe. There's a very subtle, these are all grays. Um, but I, I didn't want any two stripes to be identical in color. Like you've all this opportunity to mix your colors. Why would you want to have the same color? So in this one, I, I took the liberty of, you know, every single one of these is its own gray, a few pops of color. Um, uh, so, but this palette, I took like, I chose about three or four colors from here. Notice the, the pink and there's turquoise and a few colors. And then I went to this painting, and this was my slop board. So a uh, slop board is when you have leftover paint, you don't know what to do with it. You, you might want to throw it out, but you decide not to. So you need something to put it on, and this was a slop board. Um, all of this pink came from, well, actually from that painting. That's the same pink. And I got a shot of it, and it, it's, it's literally so horrible to look at. But it was just, you know, it was all this. And then I took, these bands are basically variations of the colors from that. Can you guys see how these two relate in color? Not necessarily in composition, but in color. So I love stripes, I love dots. This is my variation of stripes. Those are my dots. Um, these colors and the colors in there. So that's why these two pieces speak to one another for me. 
and there's chaos here. But, and I knocked out, this, this entire painting looked like this. But then I came in with these bands and then I manipulated the color to, to get, you know, whatever kind of saturation I wanted. And of course there's some geometry. This straight line was um, with an awl. And then there's some hand done mark making. So mark making is, is really important for me. So is complex color and then unusual shapes that are different and interesting. And then this is the one I told you about where I took the secondary and primary colors in squeeze bottles and put these two panels. There was a mate to this one. Same size. And I, I literally took the paint like this and I think I then mono printed the ugly colors one over the other and the only, only place you can actually really see that anymore, let's see, maybe, and even this up here, this little tiny area is kind of a glimpse of what was underneath there, but this is acrylic underneath. Here's a glimpse of what it was. Um, but because it was glazed over so many times, it's very desaturated now. But these are a hint of what I used to be, right? And saying, I used to be ugly. I'm not saying that this is beautiful, but this is me. And I was not this. This is like, this made me very nauseous. And as much as other people loved it and said, oh my gosh, I love that, don't touch it, you know? It's like, are you kidding? Um, so it, it became, and its mate was uh, kind of similar. I mean, if you look closely, there is a grid here. I took my awl and it's a grid. It's usually not a perfect grid. This one is not a perfect grid. There are only a few shapes that you can really identify. Again, this is a very quiet piece, like, kind of like the ampersand piece. Now this one um, was, um, if, you, if you forget that there's pink there, it was done at the very same time as this one. And this one I was very happy with. And this one I, I was like, I had a show coming and it's like, okay, I, I need another piece. I'm going to throw it in the exhibition. And I, I didn't feel really good about it. And then I brought it home and it's like, wow, I really don't like it now. So again, I turned it around for a long time. But then I brought it out when I got to the new studio and I'm like, um, I was, uh, whatever we were doing in, in our pro membership, I just decided to play around with the stencil and I made these stencils and I, I put them all over in kind of a grid. Um, and I did kind of say, well, I loved, I love this area here, so obviously I tried to save it. But the rest was pretty random and I had full intention once I pulled the stencils off to keep working on it, but, and I really, really mixed this pink. Uh, it, it wasn't straight out of the tube. It's actually quite complex. It has a lot of uh, grays added to it. And um, I think what the pink came from, those animal crackers that Willa probably has, that has the pink frosting, you know. That's kind of the pink I was thinking about. It's, it's not the same pink, but it is a pink. And so this is kind of the, the, the innocence of life, right? The, um, the happiness, the joy, being a child, like that's pink for me. But what's underneath it is like life itself. It's, it's full of turmoil and these things that are, are, are very coarse and rough. Um, so this is called undercurrent because of the black and white. And again, this one doesn't have the pink over it because I was, I was happy with this. But again, there's a grid, grid, grid. And then this one was another one. I, I actually started to do a YouTube live and this is paper that I actually um, cut correctly after because I learned my lesson from that one and I actually cut this correctly. And I remember doing this um, video on YouTube and I was just getting started and um, I kept my palette limited. Obviously I love red and I love this deep dusty blue. Um, this is transparent earth orange. So again, a very limited palette. Um, you can do so much with a limited palette. You don't need every color. The very last thing I did on this one was, this is actually cadmium red light, but it looks fluorescent because color is completely relative and you never know what it's going to look like until you actually put it there. If I put this color against, say, an orange background or sort of a desaturated orange, it'd be like, oh, that's orange. But here it looks fluorescent. Does it look fluorescent to you? Yeah. Um, grid here a little bit. Um, again, it, part of like personal voice is you got you to gotta express the things you care about. Um, and the grid is so much a part of me. I love the color red. I love my crazy mark making. I love a sense of geometry. This is a variation of a circle. Circles are part of a grid. Um, it's kind of like a, there's a story being told here. I mean, does Pam love red? She must love red. Um, does she love stripes and dots? Well, here's some collage paper. And again, I feel like each piece is kind of autobiographical. Um, any questions so far about it? So when you're um, sitting, 
the ones with a more scratched in grip where you're a right. bit more precise about how you're doing that. Are you going from one grip piece to the next grip piece because something said, well, I've got an idea from this, but it, it's, it doesn't go in this piece, it becomes a new piece? Or are you bouncing from a hard grid to a softer yeah. back and forth? So I think that's probably one reason why these don't, uh, it's not like you say, like if that, ha that were the case, then I would say that they were done in the same time period because they were hanging in close proximity. Um, the proximity of a piece being made is very important as to how much it may cross-pollinate. But due to my schedule and the way that I operate and the amount of wall space, and when I was in the Grange, I, I literally could work on one piece at a time. It's either this size or it could be as big as, say, that piece. But I could never have this many going on at a time. Now in my studio, I can. And I, I'm excited because I have a feeling that one of the things I want to try is like I'm going to mix up some kind of a palette and go around like a bee and, you know, like put something in every single palette, uh, every single panel, and then come around, mix up another color, do it again, different shape, whatever. So that's how cohesion really becomes a factor when you actually have the opportunity to work on many things at one time, but I've actually never had the space or time to do that. Now that the pieces are here, I've got three months to do that. <laughs> While these pieces are out of my studio, um, you know, I have a different arrangement now. So it's a good question. I'd say that like, if, if this had been hanging next to that piece, which was hanging to, say, another piece on that side, yeah, it'd be like, well, I'm, I'm going to, you know, but I, I actually, on the other hand, uh, don't ever want to repeat myself in the same way. So I might scratch into this one, but it would never be in the very same way I scratch into that one. It always has to feel like a, something new. Like, what haven't I done yet? I have a very hard time repeating anything twice because I'm not learning anything from it. I guess it's just not as exciting. Yeah, Kathy. What do you say to the penguin and the fact that all the line work is behind it? Well, that was a big question I had because part of me was like, surely it can't be done yet. All I did was like put pink paint over black and white. It couldn't be that easy, could it? And so I was really prepared to come back into it on every single day I came into my studio. It's like, is today the day that I go back into this and start to like scrape the heck out of it and morph it into something else? And I kept asking myself, you know, should I do it? And I think the only thing I did, there's one very faint line. It could be even like this and here. Yeah, it's right here. I, I tried it, and it's like, you know, I don't think so. Yeah, so it works great, and it doesn't seem the same yeah. thing as you do a lot of beautiful lines. Exactly. Like, but it is all in that vacuum. It's all there. Right, and I think that's a good point in that just because I did it in one painting, does that mean I should do it in the next painting? No, you better think about it because maybe this painting is telling you something else. I think I don't want to get into any habits. Um, habits to me are, and again, cohesion is on the scale. And I, I, I guess diversity is, is kind of like I'm more leaning toward diversity than I am toward cohesion. And it's like because that's the way I am. I'm, I'm very. Um, the number of jobs I've had in life are like so many that I don't think I've ever wanted to do any one thing. That's kind of Byron would say that's true. <laughs> He's the only constant. I mean, I have one husband who's really super. <laughs> I never needed to have more than one husband. One's plenty. <laughs> um, okay, so then um, any other questions about anything that I've talked about? There's only one piece left here. And... I have a question. Sure. What dictates what kind of substrate you choose to use? For to paint on a... Yeah. Well, uh, it's either going to be a panel, which this would be a cradle panel, uh, wood panel, and it has an eighth inch uh, surface of Baltic birch. Uh, if it's acrylic or cold wax and oil, it's gessoed with white, but you can use a colored gesso. Or, like the piece behind Abigail that's crazy and chaotic, that was paper, that's oil paper that has cold wax and oil. And the reason, people have said, well, why don't you just work on panel if you're going to mount your, your paper on panel, right? Well, the answer is that it takes space and they're heavy. By painting on paper, let's say I did 50 paintings and I've got a show coming up, I'll choose three to mount. I'm not, I don't have to store them. I can, I can throw them into a drawer. Uh, it's, you know, as I get older, it's getting harder and harder to lift these panels, you know? It's hard, it's hard, they're heavy. Um, so I have to, I do think that I'm moving in, I'm gonna start moving into canvas and perhaps I need to change 
if you work on canvas, you can work with acrylic, you can work with oils, but not so much cold wax and oils. That cold wax and oils doesn't like that. So I might be going more traditional oils because then I can roll it up and not have to, you know, space. So yeah, any other questions? Okay, so this one was um, my, again, an experiment. So my studio is a lab. I'd like to say that that is the only experimental artist and um, everything for me is about, like, again, what haven't I done? What can I do that's exciting? And, you know, in, in, in this contemporary age of art, um, it's, it's a lot about kind of upcycling and not, you know, we think about the environment and not throwing things away. And um, if you notice, like, a lot of the, the papers that you see here were things that I, I would have normally thrown out. I was digging through the garbage for this piece because one of my favorite artists is Mark Bradford. And if anyone knows Mark Bradford, yeah, his work largely comes from garbage that he picks up on the street. And he does enormous works. And I just like, I'm just like awestruck by his work. Well, this is kind of like, um, starting with that, a lot of collage material, but realizing that that's not a painting. You know, of course, a lot of people, when they saw that stage, like, oh, stop right there, I love it. And I'm like, you can't possibly love this. Then I covered it up with um, just white paint and let it dry. Got up with a little sander, sanded everything, everything, you know. Um, but it wasn't done, but it was better. And before I put the white paint on, though, I, I put tape here as a resist. And then some of the final things I did were like, you know, putting in some, uh, some more uh, shapes that were identifiable. Um, this is collage paper. This is a collage shape. I painted here. Um, I drew this, you know, I can, there are just very few things I added to it. I put this kind of mathematical thing up here. Um, little, again, this, this to me is kind of like, um, uh, the things that you see are things that I, I really respond to, right? I love the color red. I love asymmetric writing. I love the circle. This is a spiral. Um, I love symbols, but not too, not too many and not too literal. I love blind contour drawing. Um, I love uh, textured, degraded, dilapidated surfaces like an old wall that's been weathered. This is botany, I love botany. So again, what you really kind of notice in this painting is, well, whatever you do see, it must have, you know, not doesn't must, but in this case, it has meaning to me. And you might not know that, but by looking at artwork, hopefully you feel that. Uh, and for those of you who are getting the videos on this, there's like three more to come that, that explains the rest of that process. So should we head upstairs? <laughs> this is really my very first work on canvas. I uh, have normally worked, hi Willa. I normally have worked on panel or paper. Uh, so, but I've always, you know, so many artists work on canvas and it was like, well, maybe it's time to try that. And I didn't stretch first. I actually just tacked it to the wall and I, I gave it an extra border all the way around, thinking that if it works out, because you never know if it will, um, that I would then mount this onto a stretched um, stretcher bar. Uh, so again, limited palette, and this one was really inspired, I'd say, by um, our mother was a pattern maker, pattern designer, and um, both my sister and I love to sew. And so you'll see like if, if you are a seamstress, you notice that there's like a sleeve pattern. Um, there are various like things that look pattern-like, but the whole dotted line thing is very much what you'll find on the, the thin tissue paper. And then I worked in like letters of our family and, but a very limited palette. And, and this under layer of the yellow and the red, black and the white, that was the chaos part. And then came the calming down part, like, well, what, you know, um, it, it also feels very architectural to me. It's not, this is not much as, uh, as much about the grid as it is more architectural. Um, it, it just feels more maybe urban to me. And, and it's also like a test. Can I really like take my all on canvas? Am I going to punch a hole through it? And clearly I could, but I had to have a lighter touch. And this one also has a lot of sanding to it. So, Again, like this is very weathered. It wouldn't have been the same painting if it had been a solid, you know, solid yellow color. So um, I wanted to distress the surface because that's very much also a part of my process. This distressing here where none of this red was showing until I hit it with sandpaper. Then the red shined through because of its, uh, it's, it's actually a little bit higher, um, thicker paint. So any questions about that one? Your substrate or substrate is paper? This is canvas. 
canvas. Yeah, it's a, it's a lower quality gessoed canvas because I thought okay. if I'm my first one, I'm not going to use the best kind of, you know, canvas. You said you were sanding it, and I'm going like, wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, did you not? No, you can sand canvas. Yeah. Yeah, canvas. Oh, okay. Oh, you thought it might be paper, yeah. Paper for your... Yeah, true. That's true. So canvas and board are, you know, they can take a certain amount of beading. And and this um, project here is like a really big... Uh, when I started my membership group, let's see, um, it was the fall of 2021. So we haven't been existing too long, but... Um, before, uh, before we really got started, I said, hey, let's just do a community project while I'm still working on content. And I said, whoever wants to, to do this, you know, send me an envelope with like some swatches of like colors that are meaningful to you. And I didn't really say how big the swatches should be or if they should be a solid color. Um, I didn't say any of that. I just said, send me some swatches. So I got envelopes that were tiny and I got like gigantic things. Um, some people sent me, you know, all these different um, kinds of things. And my original idea was to take everybody's contribution and make one big piece. But when I started to read the letters, and they were like, some were really personal. You can kind of see, um, in many cases, I've, I've included parts of what they wrote to me, but not everything, because some of it was personal and, you know, kind of. So, um, but. But oftentimes it was the letter itself they wrote to me, like their handwriting or... So part of this is it's a collaborative thing between me and these individual artists. And, and this whole piece is about individuality. Well, my original idea was to make one piece, one cohesive piece, or one piece that could be in this uh, exhibition, it became um, a relationship between me and another person, each artist that sent me something. I spent quite a bit of time on these, like of everything in this exhibition. This project was the most time consuming because I didn't want to rush through it. I wanted to really like read what they wrote to me, think about design. Um, design was a big portion of every single thing. I didn't want to use anything that they didn't send me. So the only thing I might have added was a color to the actual um, piece of paper, but then everything else came from them. I didn't add anything, maybe some thread. I might have punched holes in it, but I didn't add anything from my studio. It was, everything came from them. So this represents definitely the individuality. And, you know, I, I really tried to, I mean, I didn't have to try hard for these to be different. They just were different because everybody's different. And um, I, in some cases, there's like, they were harder to design than others, but uh, I just hope people get a, a feeling for variety and individuality. That's kind of what, yeah. But then things that were sent to you, I'm assuming based on how they appear on each piece, you cut them up and... Yeah, so, so right, they sent me, imagine you get an envelope and you get, um, somebody opens a magazine and they light the color turquoise and they tear it out. So you get, they put it in the envelope. And then um, they write me a letter. And then they, they grab pieces from their palette. Like this is torn palette paper. Uh, this one was so, more or less solid colors, but then I, I tore some, I cut some. So all of the cutting was done by me. All the designing was done by me. But the raw materials were what they sent to me. So fabric, um, you know, could be wrapping paper, could be magazine paper, could be photographs, could be stamps. Um, this, this one had a story. Um, this gal, her mother died when she was 19, and these were her, a picture of her mother. And she wrote me this, also including some pieces of a, a printing of a photo of my mother's face, a wave of corner of her smile, and a clipping of the image of her eye. She passed when she was only 19 years old, and I was a toddler. So some of these are like... <sighs> oh, see, just tell more stories. What's that? More stories. More stories. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. It's, it's really like um, some of them were kind of heart-wrenching. You know, some people really kind of opened up and this gal Leslie Price um, very much uh, interior design dressmaking so again the pattern pieces that this is pattern this is like a photocopy of a pattern so I just used her her photocopy and then I cut out out of her paper um, a shirt pattern and collar and you know blouse um, this one was coconut fibers, and this one is from Stacy Erickson. I, I tried to put their names in there for a while, and Mary Dargan, um, she used to live in Hamilton. She came to my studio, and uh, she's cared for her older mother, um, and, and she labeled all of her swatches, so that was what I tried to capture there. 
Um, There's a very whimsical one here with this one here? Yes. Yeah, this this one is, um, oh yeah, so cute, because, <laughs> you know, again, like, they went crazy. They, they sent me, I asked for seven swatches, and I sometimes got 50, <laughs> and I didn't use them all, and it's like this little, she had like, envelope with these, and she had another envelope, and, and I, I, again, less is more, I had to, like, I couldn't use everything they all sent me. Um, so I wanted to capture the fact that she sent me this envelope and each swatch was like really, really different and she loved music and this one was challenging because I got, you know, some people sent me 3D objects and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, what am I going to do? And uh, Cece, where is she? She's got two pieces in here. There, one has like all this ribbon on it. This one here, to like, I, I think I did two pieces with what she sent to me because there was like a real sentimental thing. I mean, obviously this person had a message here because um, she wrote in her letter something about saving the rhino as an endangered species. So I cut these out, but she sent me that. And some things were like, you know, like I didn't even add these dotted lines till the end because they were too simple. This one, I loved the, um, the actual envelope. This was the envelope. So sometimes I didn't even use their swatches. This one's a Canadian. And this one's from um, Australia, that's Belinda. And you know, this little thing where I just put little dots to balance the grid. Now Robert Simmons was this one, and I had really fun with this. This was one of the earliest ones I did, and that's Robert there. Um, but I, um, I love how kind of minimalist it feels, and so this gave me the opportunity to, to kind of experiment with some uh, minimalism, and uh, some like, let's see, where's that one? If, I, if there was a breeze in here, I would see, it's this one. This is like one of the last ones I did. And um, yeah, they move in. This is a palette, palette paper, and um, it's what she wrote to me that I wanted to a little bit extra something in there because of what she wrote to me. You know, it's like sometimes it's like, wow, I, I really want to spend some time with this one. So. Did you actually send back image to them? I mean, have they seen what you've done to their scraps? <laughs> a lot of these came together. Like, I, I started in the Grange. I got through about 100, I think. And then I, I realized that I have the show coming. I've got to work on the other 67. So I was like, really, like, every day, got to do 10 of these. So literally every day for the several days, I, I did 10 or 5, as many as I could do. I have a photo of every single one, but I wanted to get this installation photo, and I didn't know what it would look like. Now I have it. So I'm going to send them the installation photo and a photo of their individual piece. And if they came here to the opening, they get to, they take their piece home and we'll just kind of like, you know, move the pieces together. And it's just like, these are my, almost like my letter back to the artist. It's not meant to be a, a masterpiece of any kind. It's, it's, it's my, re my response to them. And so, yeah. Any questions? It's amazing. Oh, thanks. And you made it come along. I hope when so. I look at it, I was so that really, really was fabulous. To, to thanks. Just point out anything. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Kathleen. Yeah, I, I wasn't really sure how well it would hang together, but you know, Donna's a quilter, and her quilts are beautiful. And I kind of thought, well, it's not quite as organized as a quilt. It's crazy, but um, crazy quilt. It's a crazy quilt. There you go. <laughs> and that piece down there is. Um, one that I, one of a, it's actually an older painting, but um, it's an acrylic, and um, if you notice the surface, it might feel a bit like an encaustic, but that's because of the way that I do the final coating. It's um, first um, pouring medium uh, to get it to be super flat and glossy, and then I, uh, I use like four knot steel wool, and I rub the surface so it gets dull. And then after that, I put um, cold wax medium on it very thinly, let it dry, and then I buff it. And, and the surface, it's really very much like encaustic, which is what I, I, that's the surface I love. So I try to get that into any other medium I can. But I documented this entire painting on my YouTube channel, and um, I talked the whole time. And, you know, I, I'm glad I documented it because I clearly just don't, you know, I wasn't thinking. I was talking while I thought, and I would have to go back to that video myself to remind myself, like, what was I doing? What was I thinking? I don't know. But again, this is the, the thing about this type of art is um, it's kind of like automatic painting. You know, you're not really thinking. But I do think in the final stages to pull it together. You, I mean, you could leave it without thinking, I guess, but it would be a totally different painting. Uh, the intentional things are things like this that come at the end, this that came at the end. 
um, deciding whether this this is too too much. Do I want to you know gray it down with something more solid? So it's kind of like, do I need more quiet areas? This this central area gave me a lot of trouble. I really struggled with that. Um, so I remember the struggles, but yeah. So any questions? <laughs> Yeah. What did you say you did after you did the steel wool rub? That's just a thin layer of cold wax medium, cold pure wax. cold wax medium. You're not mixing with the acrylic, you're putting it on top of dried either Liquitex um, pouring medium or Golden's uh, self leveling gel. But they're similar, but the Liquitex product has a little bit more working time. When you work on this scale, you need more time to get it to level out, and if it starts drying on you, then you know it's not going to be smooth, so it's not going to be able to self-level.